Okay, let's get into this week's big topic and as I say, could it really be anything else uh, after the news broke on Friday about Peter Lowell's return to the club? He'll officially return to the club as non-exec chairman and will take up that role officially on the 1st of January 2023. Ian Bankier will retire after 11 years in the role to pave the way for Peter's, Peter Lowell's return. Though Paddy, has he ever actually been away is the big question. So what we'll do, we'll break this topic into a few key sections, but first of all, I'm keen to hear your initial responses to the appointment. I'll come to you first, James. Like I said earlier on, I've, I've written a whole load of good and bad, because let's be honest, there, there is good and bad. It's not, you know, Peter Law all bad. The 10 in a row thing is what's hanging over everyone and the influence, the over-influence, the overreaching he was, he was doing um, when he was at Celtic as, as CEO. If Celtic want to be taken as a professional club, then the way I've kind of got to it is, yes, it's fine, but only if these kind of things. So no influence over Nicholson. Uh, definitely nothing to do with the dressing room. I think it's a real sore one for his for his son, Mark Lowell, because if, say, Angie decides that, do you know what, it's not quite working out with Mark Lowell, oh, wait a minute, his dad's the chairman. So, you know, the, the things like that, I just think it's clumsy, lazy, all of that. But if Lowell just comes in and does his job, which is, you know, an ambassadorial position and influences things like ECA, European Club Association starts to move towards professionalisation of the SFA and the wholesale changes required there. It can be a good appointment. I'm cautiously optimistic about it, but I think there's huge risks as well. Yeah, lots of caveats there. I mean, in principle, a non-exec chairman, you know, inverted commas, shouldn't play any active part in the day-to-day -day running of any club, should they? No, but the problem at Celtic is we've got non-exec direct directors that have been there for 27 years. I think the guidelines are nine you know, you need to change things up, stop things getting stale because they just start to nod along and Lowell knows all these guys, knows how they work. Whether some are on the gravy train or not, you know, you can maybe split the room on that in terms of some are, some aren't. But we need new, fresh, non-execs on the board that will stand up for themselves mm -hmm. because he's a man that needs to be stood up to as we've known, you know, found out to our cost. Yeah. Paddy, what about you? Where do you stand in this one? Um... I think time will tell, obviously, with the appointment. It's um, it's not one I'm happy about. Um, and the reason the reason for that isn't just 10 in a row. Um, you know, we, we look at the achievements of Brendan Rodgers um, and what he done for Celtic at a time where that should have been happening. Um, I always kind of say that, um, you know, some of the best days of my life was watching those watching us win those trebles. And they really were. And, you know, the, even the wins... The game against Hearts when we won the treble treble and Neil Lennon was appointed manager after. I remember that the elation of being like feeling amazing and then thinking, well, well, wait a minute. That's a bit of a backward step. And that was my opinion on it at the time. And, you know, I think we were all kind of proven right come the end of uh, of Lennon's Lennon's time at the club. Um but it just doesn't sit with that. We should have been winning trophy after trophy after trophy in that period. Ten in a row should have been in the bag. And what has happened since the O'Neill days, since Matt O'Neill left, is that this team has tightened the finances, tightened the budget, and sat happily with a domestic side, which is going to win trophies. They've been more than happy with that. It's appeasing the fans. It's getting one over Rangers. And that, that was the vision of the club. We've not won a knockout tie since 2003 in Europe. That's massive. That's embarrassing. And this guy... It was the front of that, in my opinion, as well. What we need to be looking at, in my opinion, is fresh eyes, like like uh, Jamie said there. And I just think this is potentially just a sign that, yeah, albeit Michael Nicholson seems to have come in and, and you know, opened the bank book a bit for us. And we, we are seeing these players coming in. But is this going to be the, the, the beginning of slow it down a bit? Slow it down. We just need to do this domestically. I hope not. That's my worry. Yeah. There's definitely pros and cons all over the place here. Um, so, it's, you know, it's not cut and dry. But what we'll do, we'll look over some of the pros and cons. I'll go through some of the lighter ones and actually I'll just run through them. Then there's some that definitely <laughs> should be discussed in a bit more detail. So, pro number one, Peter Lowell. So I think he got on board just after Seville in 2003. I think that's timing-wise. He spent almost 18 years as CEO from 2003 before retiring from that role last summer in summer 2021. During the time, the club won 29 trophies including 13 league titles and a quadruple treble. Pro, tick, all good, right? Facts, can't argue with that. 
This is not Noel McGrath talk. First, uh, first con coming up. And you've touched on it there, Paddy. Despite the occasional highlight here and there, our European results have been generally very, very poor in that 20-odd year spell since then. Uh, we failed to qualify for the Champions League on a number of occasions, losing out at the playoff stages to teams like Maribor, Malmo, AEK Athens and Cluj. We absolutely, as a club, should be competing with them. You know, you're looking back, and I've you know, done a bit of research today. You know, Arsenal put us out one year, no bother, Fair enough. right? Put the pause up on that. Maribor, Malmo, all these, no excuses for that. And that's because we constantly failed to back whatever manager was in place at the time ahead of those qualifiers. But don't worry, James, I've got another pro coming up just to keep, keep it positive. Need it. Um, again, you touched on it. So Peter Lowell's got huge experience domestically and in Europe and currently represents Celtic on the board of the ECA, the European Club Association. And this could be vital for the club uh, during these times of change and upheaval for the European Games. So it's very important that we've got a say in what goes on there and, and how we fit into that moving forward. Um, the second, for me, big con is that during his time, certainly as chief exec, and hopefully you know he's moving into a very different role now. But during his time, he was a very stubborn, stubborn negotiator. And again, you know, as I mentioned, he would rarely speculate to accumulate. And po- probably due to his accountancy background, we missed out on a lot of key signings. The two most recent ones for me is John McGinn, who's now worth twenty odd million, and Ivan Tony, who's worth probably double that. Mm-hmm. I'm saying worth that, but that's what the market yeah. down there will dictate. Um, by contrast, some of the field signings over the years are incredible. Mo Bangura, Marin Shved, Stefan Shepovic, Adam Virgo. Tell me when you want me to stop because it just, just stop. goes the first, on the first one. and on and on. There's so many. Just kind of interject a wee bit on this. Please and, do. And I can feel no, much in agreement. We spoke about it a few weeks ago that even if that is your style as a, as a CEO, as an accountant, whatever it may be, it has been proved to be financially crippling because you spend a lot and you don't make any money because they're just dead assets on your balance book so surely he's able to have the humility maybe not of, of even looking back and saying look turns out that was the wrong way to go and it's what we're doing now is we're taking guys in you know about two and a half million now or ten million whatever it may be and say well that that's got to be the future and it's how the manager wants to do it so i hope he if he can't keep his you know knows out of uh, Michael Nicholson's business, he should at least respect that what we're doing now works better than what he did. I hope so on that. Sorry, uh, Tino. I, I, I hope so on that one, Jamie, because kind of what you're saying about, you know, looking at what we what could have been, you know, going into all the uh, Champions League qualifiers we beat on at centre-half. Player, player, players not being in the team and enough time to settle. We should have been sending our players in the January. I always say that. Give them that four or five months period to get used to the team and then they're good to go for the summer. He goes to this uh, the ECA setup, and everything that we were getting from those meetings was is that you know the Champions League is likely to change, European football is going to change, there's going to be more money available, but Celtic and uh, and, uh, and Rangers probably are, are, are looking to be included in this and not forgotten. And I'm like, well, the only reason, the only way you won't be forgotten is if you make sure your team's in it every year. And he wasn't doing it, and that's that's a big worry. Um, but to go and join this board and say. That there, that there are teams pulling away from us. A lot of that lies at his door, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, and it's teams like Porto, Benfica, <laughs> you know, Dutch teams who have you know run a money ball system for the last 10, 15 years. Yeah, when we were just you know doing the bare minimum to try and squeak in. It's a bit of a contradiction, isn't it? When you're sitting at that top table, you know, making your demands as a club at Celtic's level, yeah. and the guy next to you turn around and say. Did, did Malmo not just beat you? Exactly. Did, did Maribor beat you? You know, it's, it falls in deaf ears to an extent. They are riding on Jock Steen's coattails still. 100%. Degree, 100%. You know? um, f- what do you think, James, from Michael Nicholson's point of view? So obviously he came in on an interim basis when the Dom Mackay experiment uh, unravelled before being given the role as chief exec on a permanent basis. He's performed exceptionally well during that time. His stock is as high as it could be amongst the fans. He's deemed to be very popular, mostly by virtue of backing the manager. And that's all you really want from your board and from your chief exec and to make sure that you're running a you know a, a tight organisation, that aside. Now that Michael Nicholson is the top man, you know, he's worked he was part of Peter Lowell's old regime. He worked under Peter Lowell, directly under him actually. He won't be of a mind to now be undermined, you know, and it, a lot of people are speculating that Peter Lowell's now going to come in, nudge Michael Nicholson aside and say, right. 
I'm back in town and this is how it's going to go. I think from what we've seen of Michael Nicholson, he's a, he's a more reserved personality. He's certainly not as bombastic as a Peter Lowell might be. But I don't think Michael Nicholson's going to just step aside and let anyone take over what he's doing. No, I, you know, he's a very intelligent and talented, talented individual. And if he is found to be the kind of CEO that does that, his career's over at Celtic or otherwise. And, you know, he'll be an ambitious guy with his own goals for his, his career, whether it's Celtic or, or beyond in, in years to come. So he couldn't pick up that kind of reputation. I don't, I don't see that happening. That's not to say it couldn't be tried mm. and it could push him. But he'd have to make a decision of whether he wanted to accept that or, or leave. Um, I think it's more that, it's not even more on top of that, that guidelines are that a CEO shouldn't become chairman, particularly when he's got a relationship with the replacement CEO, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we've, we've read that a few places and it's, the problem with that is they're guidelines and it happens in the business world all the time, but it leads to Celtic looking like a dynastic business. We tried that, didn't work if you remember the 1994 takeover from McCann. Yeah. So when you start to have a CEO that's now chairman, oh, and his son also works there. I mean, that is no slight Mark Law. I believe him to be a talented individual that seems to be doing good stuff, but Mm -hmm. it just starts to, you know, poison the well a wee bit. And I suppose that takes me to timing. It's all going so well. Why now? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a very valid point. We'll maybe get to that in the next wee bit that we cover, but it's um, you're right in terms of that best practice guidelines. I think Celtic voluntarily sign up for a code of conduct as part of, you know, who they are as a body and a PLC and all that. And one of the suggestions, not, you know, absolute requirements, yeah. is that you go through a full interview process with a number of suitable candidates, potentially with a, a neutral HR advisor to make sure it's all fair and proper. I'd be amazed if anybody else has been spoken to in relation to this job. I think the moment it was clear that Celtic were making a change or Ian Bankier decided, whoever decided, I'm not too sure. But the moment it was realised that someone else was required as chairman, it just seems to be that it was an absolute shoe on. So uh, just a you quick one, Paddy. We were on the way to Leverkusen. That wasn't yesterday. And we were told Law was going to be chairman. That was last November, a year ah, ago. 21. November. So, sorry, Paddy. No, yeah. it's all right. No, you're, you're, you're right. It's kind of, it's a strange it's strange timing. The summer, for example, just, just put it out there then. I, obviously, there must have been things to be kind of tied up before it went into place. Um, it's just, I'm not surprised at it. I don't think the timing really changes too much in the sense that I've always kind of felt that Lowell's never been away. <laughs> you know, I always kind no. of think that he will always have his say in this club. Um, and that's just the way, kind of what you mentioned earlier, is that that's the way that Desmond likes it. You know, it's... You want change and you change the owner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aye. And it's, that, it's window dressing to talk about Law and Nicholson and all these yeah. things. If you want real change, you need to change the owner. Absolutely. James, as the old saying goes, if nothing changes, nothing changes. On that's, that one, it's, that's a bit deep. It's, uh, it's Croatia who go through. Oh, Croatia. Yeah, yeah. Japan are out. In extra time or penalties? Penalties. Hope, mm. hope we haven't done a pre deal for Yanovic. It has. It's a five million. <laughs> price of the roof. Maybe it is five million per game. So here's <laughs> what we get to the final. Poor Dyson. <laughs> Poor Dyson. <laughs> um, getting back though to the, the pros and cons, as I mentioned, there's a few more of each and it gets a wee bit heavier as, as we go through. So the next pro in terms of Peter Lowell's standing is that. I very much believe, in fact, I know that he is a genuine Celtic supporter. And 100%. D- despite the mistakes that have been made, I genuinely believe, in his own way, he's got the best interests of the club at heart. Um, he's ex- been extremely well paid by Celtic over the years, there's no doubt about that, and there's various figures of, of his remuneration. Um, but it's also clear that he knocked back even more money when Arsenal tried to lure him as their chief exec in 2008. So if he was solely money motivated, he could have gone and you know achieved those ambitions elsewhere. The other con, however... Again, you've touched on it, James. It was the sheer arrogance that was shown when Neil Lennon was appointed and the arrogance in general during that failed 10 in a row season. You know, the whole thing about, yeah, we had other CVs, but we put them in the bin, so all that like kind of stuff. And I think many thought at the time that the decision to appoint Lenny permanently in the showers and all that chat was destined to fail. And it did fail. And I think that's what sticks in so many throats. Exact same reaction as Paddy. You were on the bus with me coming out of uh, Hamden. And it was all treble treble, cock a hoop, sticky game, got there thanks to Odson, brilliant, off we go to enjoy it, and then poof, bang, right down the earth. Um it, it was that and then the way they tried to, you know, mug you off after and saying, you know, this was the best guy, even if, you know, whoever would put their hand in the ring, they wouldn't be getting it. Lennon was the man for the job. Every single Celtic fan that I've ever spoken to knew at that point, this is looking shaky for ten in a row. Remember the review? 
Remember that? Things were going horribly wrong. Got to around about November, December and fans were protesting. And I think it was Banker maybe that came out and said, don't worry, we'll carry out a review and we'll, we'll let you know in January. And we all thought, you know, Lennon would be off and different things. And it was just a line to keep us at bay for another couple of months. And it was a slap in the face. Yeah. yeah. As you say, James, you, you were getting mugged off. And listen, painful as, as it can be at times when things aren't working out in the park, you can make your peace with it if you think everyone's pulling the same direction and there's a bit of transparency from your club to say, here's what we've done, we've tried this, this has happened. You just felt you were getting fleeced at that time. We've, we've went through a really tough Champions League campaign there, you know, with really poor points return. Again, every Celtic fan I speak to is right behind it. You know, mm-hmm. it was tough, we didn't get what we wanted, but the intent was there from absolutely every Celtic player, all the coaching team and the fans. So like you're saying, if everyone everyone's got the right attitude, we're not looking to be just, you know, moaning for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. There's a last very, very big and very important pro to Peter Lowell's presence at Celtic in recent times, and it's the fact that he was pivotal in bringing Ange Postacoglu to the club. Again, Celtic tried to give us a bit of spin that Don McKay was involved in that. and He's my man. I wouldn't mind asking somebody about how that came to be, because cause that was spin that was thrown our way, that Dom's a new guy, and he's brought in Ange. It's, I, I think that's what it's been, yeah. yeah. Just, just to drive that. You know, it, it makes sense. Everyone's kind of come off the back of low and, and are a bit like, like good riddance. Let's see how good the new guy can be. It's been sloppy PR at best though, because since then that's all come out in the wash. Ange himself saying, listen, Peter Lowell was pivotal to this whole thing. Um, so yeah, so obviously he's, he, he was hugely important, whether it was through Mark Lowell's links with the City Group or however it came to be, Peter Lowell's played his part in appointing what I would say is the best Celtic manager in many a year. And everybody by and large is, is so happy with, with Ange and, and what he's doing at the club and, and how he's turned things around. So that's a, a huge plus, you know, that, that, you know, Peter Lowell's identified him by whichever means and then made that appointment. The last con, however, and again, this is for some supporters, it's the, the be all and end all of as to why Peter Lowell shouldn't return. So it's, it's a biggie for so many fans. And it's the suggestion that Celtic and specifically Peter Lowell were somehow complicit in what became known as the five-way agreement. Now, this is an agreement which effectively allowed a version of Rangers to continue playing at Ibrox within the Scottish League structure. And listen, it's a complex subject, you know, and it's, I, I, I can admit I've not got my head fully around it, but there's lots to it. There's lots of information online if somebody wants to go and, you know, look it up and, and get up to speed with the finer details. But for the sole reason that Peter Lowell seemingly played some sort of part in that, or at least had visibility, some people just can't come away from that, such as the rivalry between Celtic and Rangers. And and I think some people just have, you know, set up camp in that area and they just won't move away from it. Yeah, and, you know, ably um, manipulated by the media as well, you know, post five-way agreement. This isn't some childish endeavour that, you know, we want Rangers or adversity to Rangers to be, you know, held down or anything like that. Football has to be in the Corinthian spirit of fairness and fairness didn't happen and we want results off the back of that, whether it's titles, medals, all that stuff that's now gone because of the five-way agreement. Fans won't let that go because sport has to be fair. And you can understand it, Paddy? Yeah, I think first and foremost though with, with someone like Peter Law and, and how that was handled is that, yes, granted he's, he's a Celtic fan, but I think that comes second in being a businessman and he knows that with Rangers being involved in that league, that bodes well for Celtic. Simple as. And that's what we've seen over the nine seasons, effectively, when obviously four or five of them, they weren't they weren't a part of it. And then the four seasons that they were, they've, they've built a bit of momentum. That's where we've seen a lot of penny pinching for the club. We obviously, we spoke about Lennon jumping ship because he was told he wasn't getting any more money. We've seen what happened to Ronnie Dyla and the fact that, you know, some of the signings he was given it was brought back a little bit when we brought Rodgers in after being embarrassed in a semi-final against mm-hmm. them. Um, so yeah, it made sense for stuff like that to happen. I'm not surprised at it in the slightest. Celtic, in order of the league that we play in, need that rivalry, need that money because it brings the money into the club. That's the black and white of it. No Celtic fan really, really cares about it that much. That I think there was loads that were more than happy to see them disappear. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, that's that's what this club needs. And I can see why Law you, would push towards that. Do you need it if you've got a Champions League ambition? Is it just well, well, I'll, ask a, I'll ask another question uh, down that same road. So we were all, you know, enjoying league after league mm-hmm. after league during those times, Ronnie Dyla and, and otherwise. How did you enjoy 
Pippin Aberdeen, inverted commas, Pippin Aberdeen to the league, i.e. blown them at the water by about 30-odd points, compared to going neck and neck with Rangers and winning some big Celtic Rangers games and winning the league with them uh, sitting below you. I, I enjoyed it the, bit, the same way I would win every other league, you know, in the sense that that's what we pay our money to see your team do. I, I, and I know the the angle in which you're, you're, you're putting that, but we've blown Rangers away. Mm-hmm. We're winning the league 25, 27 points before. What feels better? What f- I, I, you know, I'd rather not have a heart attack and watch his pip it with, with goal difference or anything like that. It's not, it's not worth it. I, I just think, <laughs> and I'm not going to get into the merits of how Rangers done what they've done in the five-way agreement, but I think just even taking Celtic out it, taking football out it, competitive sport is hugely based on who your biggest rivals are. And if your biggest rivals are removed, it's not as much fun. Pick the biggest derbies, Real Madrid v Barcelona, take one of them out. It's not as exciting, it's not as much fun. And I think we're in that same world. That's how I feel about it. Right. So that Aberdeen season you're talking about, blew them out of the water and all that stuff. Who did we? Who knocked us out of Europe that year? We don't know, right? Whoever it was, Maribor, mm-hmm. whoever it was. If we'd had a proper organisation that went at the Champions League and we went on a run to this and we beat Real Madrid at that and you set up new rivalries yeah. you know against teams that you come up against time and time again I can live without them tomorrow oh, I mean I get that and you know you'd love to see the progress uh, in Europe but you've got 38 games to play domestically that's a lot of games if you're not really caring knowing that you're going to cruise to the title I could open up a whole new debate with this one what should have been happening then is either A the team the club should have been looking at Reformation, whether it be within a, a European league, a reformation, Patrick, a, a reformation. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Uh, aye, uh, whether it be looking at uh, countries the likes in the Netherlands, Denmark, and bringing in teams of, of that like kind of Northern Europe, European type of small all, small country league. Right? All the big Calvinist all countries, the, basically. Aye, aye, pretty much. But we should have been looking at something like that, or the other one that should have possibly happened with obviously the lack of sponsorship in our league um, for for certain seasons. We should have been even looking at something like extending the size of the league to stop it being that monotonous four games against these teams every every year. All of that got chucked out because there just couldn't be an agreement on stuff. So I think that as much as we, yeah, we, we, we kind of, in my opinion, we sat on our hands for nine seasons and won the league. We didn't really have to do much. I can understand why they've been given almost like a lifeline. I get it. I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with it, but I totally understand as a business, that's what we had to do. Yeah, it's an interesting one and it's maybe, you know, from that sport, sport integrity point of view, James, mm-hmm. there's maybe a, another discussion for another day. Paddy, you'll just be delighted that our resident wor- wordsmith is in the house. I'm just, I'm just noted today. He's done me there, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Dynastic, <laughs> Corinthian, Calvinist, Reformation. Yeah. Miff will love that. I can Reformation, hear Paddy's. Re- no, Reformation's yeah. me now. Right. But I, I just said Reformation. He, he just told you <laughs> how to say it, right? No, um, I wasn't. <laughs> I wasn't correct you. <laughs> you, did. you did Moving on Moving on So That wasn't what I was I was talking about The Reformation You're on a high After you got uh, Mr. A. Sell It's fine That's it <laughs> The Reformation of the 16th century I got, got you <laughs> Let it go James uh, Moving forward I would so, you Paddy We'd spoken about The, the messaging And the, the timing Of the Peter Lowell uh, Announcement So obviously Celtic had a perfect opportunity to announce this news at the AGM, which took place just over a month ago on the 4th of November. We're recording here on the 5th of December. Um, at the time, uh, after being challenged on it, Ian Banker wouldn't be drawn on the subject. And when asked about it, he replied, The decision to step down was my decision. It wasn't on the board's agenda. As soon as the board has made a decision on the new chairman, it will announce it to the stock exchange. Instead of anything, you know, there, Celtic then chose to announce it just the other day, during a World Cup break and at a time when Celtic are nine points clear at the top of the Scottish Premiership table. You could say it's clever timing, James, you know, if you're being polite about it, but basically, I think, in my opinion, the club, well, I'll ask you, do you think the club are being disingenuous at that time of AGM? It's a lot of things. It's disingenuous, it's cowardly. Um, it might even be a lie. Are you telling me that that, wasn't, that decision hadn't been made at that point? I don't believe that. I don't believe it for a second. Right. Whether it was rubber stamped, ratified, whatever, that decision had been made. If you haven't made a decision of who your chairman is going to be in January and it's the 4th of November, then we've got issues with you as well. Yeah. Um, the fact that we haven't even talked about Bankier, one con I would say for Lol is he's not Bankier because there's never been a poorer fit for chairman for Celtic than Ian Bankier. There's nothing about the club, has no connection with the fans, and I'd be delighted to see the back of him. I actually am happier Lol's there than Bankier. Put it that way. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And Banker was there for eleven years, mm-hmm. and 
just I could not get the fit at all. But business is business, and that's fine. But from Celtic Football Club's point of view, there was just nothing between him and the the supporters. No, nothing at all, and I, that never but, made any sense. But see if that is it. What is he doing on? You know the, the business side of things or the Celtic influence side of things. Tell me one achievement of bankers in the eleven years he was there. Yeah, I, I don't have any answers to that. I mean, Paddy, straight up question: Did Celtic know at the time of the AGM that Peter Lawwell would be succeeding Ian Bankier as chairman? I would think so. Yeah, yeah. 100%. So there's something to play there. And don't get me wrong. You know, if you're a if you're a PR guy, <laughs> it's, it's the advice you give. Yeah, exactly Absolutely. that. So if you are asked when we should make this announcement, not then, not then. I don't know how many attend the AGM, but it's. A lot of folks, and it would have been a lot of angry folks, had Celtic said, and in other news, <laughs> pull back the curtain, outsteps Peter Lowell. So from a, a cynical point of view, a PR point of view, you can see why they wouldn't announce it, but uh, announce it away from the AGM or, or something, or, you know, just if, be more sincere. If the situation is that you feel that you can't announce your new chairman at your uh, AGM, maybe the appointment's not right. That's a, a, a fine way to put it because we're talking times past about reading the room and how often Celtic have failed to do so, particularly during that 10 row season, but there's been many examples over the years. And this is another fine example of reading the room. Re- read your audience, read your you know, supporters is, is what we are, but you know, we're looked upon as your, your customer base, if you like. And there's a huge percent. Listen, a lot of folk will be perfectly happy about the appointment. There are a serious number of fans who are not and I just don't know how much Celtic have considered that at all. Um, yeah, I think I think he, Jamie's spot on with that there, you know, like it's it's a case of this is uh this isn't something that they, they seem comfortable about. Um if they've left it this long to come and tell us and like we say, they've known this for a long time. Why why are we finding out during the World Cup? Yeah, I, I, like, it's a Friday night. Yeah, yeah f- aye, exactly. <laughs> the team's just about to go to Portugal as well, so like you know, even even Ange might not be pressed on it as much as well. It's, it is clever. It, it does make sense, and that's that's is what I'm worried about. Is this a step back in the, the the wrong direction? I get that. So I've got a positive diversion, if you like. Go for it. Or just you know, we are where we are, and we definitely are where we are yeah. because this is going to change. You know, I was talking in the studio isn't going to be Dermot Desmond going. Maybe not. Actually, we'll, we'll, we'll change that, guys. We'll put yeah. Tino in charge of the, the I chairmanship. I don't think Desmond listens, but you never know. <laughs> Maybe one of his, his kids does. But if Celtic, you know, they're talking about being cute with PR and all these things. Well, you know, utilise that. If you're going to be a PR-driven board, then utilise it and say, well, what do the fans want to hear and what do we want to deliver for the fans? So we know Ange is, you know, professionalising things all over the place. Nicholson seems to be doing a lot of the same. So where are we as a corporate entity? You know, what, what are you doing? I was talking at the top of the show about, are you making any inroads with the SFA to professionalise that? Are you having any... You know, conversations about with the referee structure that the shambles that it is and the, the old boys network that it is and all these kind of things. If we're going to be a modern club, then let's make some influence, influential changes and let the chairman be the person who leads that journey, if you like, not executively, mm-hmm. but in terms of the, the strategy of it and the, the the overall message to the fans. There's an opportunity for the, for the board to put law in a better light and they, they'll need to do something because this can drag on. They'll need to do something, and I wonder if, you know, that since Peter Lowell left the building, inverted commas, right, summer 2021, not long ago at all, it does feel like a different Celtic, even in that short space of time. You know, there's obviously been a number of changes internally. The figurehead for everything and all things good is obviously Ange Postacoglu. And you wonder if, if the various individuals involved, Ange, Michael Nicholson, Chris Mackay, the various guys at the club that are doing good things, that they'll maybe say, Yep, there's an opportunity here and, and let's do things differently. Now, my gut feeling is that not too much will change, you know, down that road in terms of the messaging and how Celtic position themselves. But why not, Paddy, come out with that kind of positive PR messaging? Listen, I've listed some of the pros of Peter Cowell, Peter Lawwell. There are dozens of pros, mm-hmm. right, if you want to really sit, sit and look in the finer detail and stuff. So why don't Celtic move further to, to capitalise on the various positive things and... and turn something which is at the moment questionable into something more positive? Because I think, albeit there are the, the, the pros, I'd, I'd probably say there's more cons though, you know, in my opinion. I, I, I think, you know, we're talking about the, the work that Nicholson's done, the work that Chris McKay's done and the work that uh, Paul Sokoglu's done. 
first and foremost, Paul Coley should be coming in as a manager and a manager only in, in a modern modern day football club. Mm-hmm. He's come in and had to do absolutely everything. I'm surprised he's not been making the tea for them as well. Just the way everything that's been mentioned, he's been doing his own uh, scouting. He's been doing his own, uh, like basically transfer negotiations with certain players. Mm-hmm. And even he said that, you know, now that the likes of Mark Lowell, uh, sorry, Mark Lowell's coming in and the likes of more scouting, coming into the team that suits the type of players that he wants, he'll eventually, eventually be in the key word to be able to take a step back. So for a club to be in that position, the state that we've been left in under that old setup, no wonder that they're really, really keeping quiet and trying to put this out whilst the attention isn't fully there, if mm-hmm. you know what I mean. It's another really good point because Ange Postacoglu had to pick up a lot of pieces, you know, when he came in the door. And, and as you say, Paddy, if the structure was right, he would have just been slotted in as almost as head coach, you know, as opposed to anything else. But as you say, he's had so much to do and it's testament to the man and who he is and, and what we now know of him that he's been able to do so successfully. But it's been far too much for one man. I do get he's the type that probably wants that though, wants that involvement, that just wants sure. to oversee everything. And probably I would say long that may, long may that continue, I think. Um, but as a team, as we try and bring ourselves up to the same level as, as clubs in Europe, that where we should be, we just want him managing. We want him, we want him still kind of looking at the players that he wants and he gets the players that he wants. None of this, Neil or Ronnie, Try this guy out, see how he does. None of that yeah. can't happen anymore. There will be flying sharks in the car park if that ever happens oh, again. Oh God! <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Um, to close out this section, so the the topic on Peter Lowell, I'm just going to read out a couple of the quotes um, that Celtic produced on the the official statement when they made the appointment, and they've they've, they've gone hold, all out. Hold your nose. They've gone all out. So there's various quotes. So there's Michael Nicholson, Dermot Desmond outgoing chairman Ian Bank here and of course Ange I'm just going to give you Michael Nicholson's quote and Ange's quote so Michael Nicholson says we're delighted to welcome Peter as chairman and I look forward to working with him as we continue to progress and develop the club Peter has a wealth of experience in the football industry at a domestic European and global level which is invaluable to the club moving forward our collective objective is to create a world class football club that our supporters can be proud of competing at the highest level with a strategy based on growth and continuous improvement so all good and it's it's hard to argue, but they've thought long and hard about what Michael's is, Michael's going to say because that's I think that's a combined effort. They've somebody said that, <laughs> yeah. So they've gone through that very very carefully. Take take that word out, put that word in. Anyway, that's how it works. And almost anything Ange was going to say was going to be fine. We know that. Um, but he's quoted as saying, "It's fantastic news for the club that Peter will be taking up the role of chairman. He was instrumental in bringing me to Celtic." So. Again, good to hear that for sure that that's on the record from Ange. Uh, I know the love he has for the club and I know that his wealth of experience and knowledge will be invaluable to us all as we move forward together. So it's all good stuff. It's a clear PR offensive by the club, timing-wise, word-wise, everything around it, not making an announcement to the EGM. But as you say, Paddy, you can can see why they've done it. So they've tried to box clever. I'd rather move them forward, they box more genuine. It would, would be my term. So final question for you both. Have either of you changed your mind or your stance in any way regarding the appointment of Peter Lowell as we've chatted that through? Time will tell. That's all I would say. I, I, I'm I'm not a fan of it at all. I don't think it's a, the right decision, especially with the, the feel-good factor around the club. Time will tell if he's got his nose in anything, if he's still got a say in stuff. Um, we will see it. We will, we will recognise it very, very quickly. And I hope you are listening, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> and yourself, James, any final thoughts on this one? I think it's just that it's pulling us back from a real... High, you know. So if companies make these types of decisions all the time when it looks like a misstep, if you're going to break momentum, whether it's you know football or, or anything else in the corporate world, if you're going to break momentum, it better be for a bigger picture reason. So tell us what it is, because at the moment it's really difficult to get our heads around. It may be just one of those he sits in the background and ticks away. My experience of Mr. Law so far hasn't been that way. Um, but there's an opportunity here to do the right thing. Um, there's changes required around about the board structure in order to affect that. It could be a stroke of genius or it could be a disaster, Paddy. That's the thing, you know, there's all options are on the table. So, listen, it's a topic which is going to rumble on for some time and the biggest hope amongst us supporters is that absolutely nothing is allowed to derail what Ange is looking to do. So, let's see how it all plays out. <laughs> 